And without further ado, I'll hand over to David Gonzalez, who's going to give us a talk on circuit breakers on steroids. Thank you. So, as they say, I'm David Gonzalez, and I, I am a consultant, but I also work for Nerfrom. So, if you want to reach me out, you can reach me at david.gonzalez at nerfrom.com. Um, here is my GitHub account as well. Um, I'm going to show some code later on, and it's going to be kind of available in there. But anyway, if you have any question or you want me to provide any other examples that I'm going to be showing today, yeah, send me an email and then I'll, I'll get back to you. Okay, so I'm also writing a book, which got published this morning. Um, the title is Developing Microservices with Node.js, uh, so feel free to buy it. <laughs> Please. Free to buy. Uh, it's not free. <laughs> it's free if you have 40 euros. <laughs> no, actually, it's, um, the publisher is a pretty uh, famous publisher, book. Um, okay. There's going to be an electronic version, uh, cheaper, probably. It's in Amazon as well, so we have a Kindle. Um, it's easier to enter. So, we've been here before. Okay. So, we're going to talk about circuit breakers, um, not only from the software point of view, but I'm also going to give some introductory examples to the real life of how a circuit breaker saved the life of a friend of mine. Yeah, let's say a friend of mine. Okay, so first, we're going to talk about my friend. Um, I'm going to call him Dan Garland. Uh, he didn't want to reveal, to reveal his, you know, um, his personality. He was frustrated because he bought a house last year in Dublin and it's really, really hard to get a good electrician here. So <clears throat> he was looking in YouTube, it's full of do-it-yourself videos for everything. Everything means everything. So his wife um, asked him to change the lamps at home because, you know, it's a, you buy a new house, you want to have um, things are a little nice. So yeah, um, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, he's an engineer, as me. And he has been paying with 1.5 <laughs> batteries for like three years, so you know it's more or less about the same. <laughs> and then the second phrase is where my friend is going to need badly a circuit breaker. So um, change the lamp without disconnecting the power. I hear it's safe as long as you don't touch two, uh, two cables at the same time. So I have a question now <coughs> for the audience. Like that's the equation. A chair. You see, it's a metallic chair plus a screwdriver <laughs> equals happy lamp. <laughs> So what happened to my friend, DG? Roasted chicken or success? It's <laughs> okay. aluminium chase, so success. We don't know yet, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, uh, first of all, before proceeding, um, my wife is called Esther. Please, if you find any coincidental, you know, fact about what happened last weekend at home, beautiful story. <laughs> so... Um, that's what saved my friend's life. It's a circuit breaker in the real world. So, my friend was on the chair um, trying to change the lamp. So what happened is the electrical current goes from the lamp into my friend, into the metallic chair. He was facing, he wasn't very smart. And that current got deviated to the earth instead of going back to the, um, to the electronic circuit. So what happens is, this is a real circuit breaker. I don't know if you are into electronics, but pretty much what happens here is um, this is where the current comes from, and then goes into the cable, which is Spanish, like me, uh, which means the, you know, the load or the lamp or my friend, and then goes back to the neutral. So, what happens is the current goes through this relay and comes back to this relay. The magnetic field in the middle, it's stabilized. So one magnetic field and uh, just pretty much voids, empties the other magnetic field, and in the middle there is no, there's not, you know, differential magnetic field. So. The circuit flows happily. But if the, if the electronic current gets lost in here, the magnetic field in here is much more powerful than here. So what happens is the circuit opens. So my friends survive. So this concept is, um, is kind of applicable to software as well. Um, and it's used to prevent a malfunctioning server or, or an overloaded server from being hit from the clients. So how many times have you been uh, monitoring production or have you been working in a server that gives you a timeout, and then uh, you have to wait in the browser for 60 seconds to time out, or 30 seconds, or whatever. That's fairly annoying. So with the circuit breaker, what we do is we prevent this behavior to have from happening to all our customers. It will happen just from, for some of them. It also helps to recover the stability on the server. So if the server is being badly loaded with you know, a lot of customer requests, client requests, and then it's not able to cope with the load, at some point, the circuit breaker is going to just remove uh, this server from the equation, and it's going to say, yep, yeah, it's not available, so don't even try again. It's perfect uh, monitoring point, um, so if 
the circuit breaker is open. That means that no request can reach the server. Um, what happens is the same uh, circuit breaker could issue a call to your monitoring uh, tool saying, there's something going on, please have a look, uh, and avoid users being demoed, as I say. So this is exactly how a circuit breaker, or at least the one that they implemented that we're going to say, uh, see later on works. We have three statutes. First one is open, um, close, or half open. So what happens is, at the beginning, all the upstreams, like let's assume that you have your client, and then you have different upstreams, like server one, server two, server three. Uh, I say server, but can be whatever. Can be even access to one printer, another printer, scanner, any device, or any um, element. So in the beginning, uh, the circuit is closed for all the upstreams. So that means all the requests can flow easily and can flow happily into the server. And then suddenly happens. Uh, suddenly something happens. Um, Depending on the circuit breaker you use and the battery you use, it could be enough with one request or with few requests or even with a ratio of failure requests to open the circuit. But when the circuit gets open, gets open, what happens is we get a fast failure or we get the response back to the client um, before waiting for the server to fail. We don't issue the request to the server because we know it's failing. Then after a timeout, which uh, by default in mind is 30 seconds, but you can tune that and you can change that it goes to half open. So in half opens, what happens is the client issues a request. If it's successful, it goes back to close. And if it, also, if it is unsuccessful, it goes back, goes back to open. It's a bit messy, but what happens is, at the end of the day, with this in mind, is if we have one server which is being faulty, only one request every 30 seconds is going to fail to what the max. So well, exactly one, which is the one that gets issued with the half open status. Then if it's successful, it goes to close and all the requests are success. But if it fails, it goes back to close and waits for another 30 seconds. So uh, probably you know, if you have been looking, and I hope you have been Googling about circuit breaking, um, Netflix created one which is called Histrix. Um, I have been using that actually last week, um, just playing with it. It's fairly amazing, it's fairly powerful. The only problem is it is written in Java, so we wanted to have something in Node.js that we can use with Seneca and other frameworks. Um, so um, it's fairly, it's a fairly good inspiration point for um, features for uh, the framework that we're writing. But as well, one thing that we want is correct statistics about an endpoint, because once you're here, why don't you collect how long it takes your server to respond for a request? and then have a kind of a dashboard saying this server is yellow because it's taking on average two seconds, but now it's taking eight seconds to resolve the request. So things like that can be done fairly easily with um, the circuit breaker. So our circuit breaker is called Visigoth. I'm not sure exactly why the name was given, but I'm happy with that. Um, it is still in development. That means that I'm going to be showing you uh, how it works, but doesn't mean that it's going to be the final version and means that it's going to be very dangerous for me because the last thing you want in front of like say 60 people is what you are showing to fail, but that's okay. Uh, it can't handle any endpoint. We've been talking about servers and printers and scanners and so on. But in reality I have one example which uh, I just add few strings to the circuit breaker and then I use the drone robin algorithm to go to choose different strings depending on the um, on the time that we, we select them. Uh, to show that it's very easy. It can be customized, so I have based um, the circuit breaker in uh, what they call an old rater. An old rater is something simple, like you have an upstream, and depending on the results of the call to this upstream, um, you can decide if this node is healthy enough or not. So what I do in reality is um, calculate, for example, the response time of, um, of the node, and what happens is the next time you choose a node to be executed, it's going to give you back the one which is healthier, so the one with the shorter response time. So what this ensures is that you will always be hitting the server that is the quickest, which is good. Um, can be used as a load balancer. We'll see an example of that. For example, this one. Can you see that well? Or yeah, okay. So <clears throat> as simple as that, Visigoth just acquire the package as usual, create the SQL breaker, and then we have two upstreams. Upstream one and upstream those, uh, upstream two. As you can see, it's just a string. It doesn't need to be a function or a server or anything like that. And then what we do is a for loop 100 times, this is off, please give me one, and then you get the upstream that you have chosen. This is a callback, which probably is not the right place to have it, 
And then this is the statistics that we will see later on that we can collect or we can customize for the endpoint. Let's see an example of this one. Um, So same code um, here. Now we execute the script, and that gives you 100 times upstream one, upstream two, upstream one, upstream two. What is happening here? So by default, as I said before, um, this thing can be customized with an operator. What it has by default is a non-robbing algorithm. So if you have, like, let's say, three upstreams, how it does it fail? It will be treating between um, upstream one, two, three, and as many as you want. So <coughs> that's coming by default in, in the SQL Breaker implementer. Um, any question about this? Everybody sees clearly how it's fairly simple. It doesn't have any complication or anything like that. It pretty much hides you all the logic behind the scenes. And then I'll show you the code. It's fairly simple. Again, it will change, but uh, for now, Kind of happy with how it works. So, let me see if we have more. Yeah, there you go. So, we have a little bit here. Um, only close and half open nodes are eligible. That's what I was talking about. Like, if the node is half open and fails, it goes back to open. Um, so, it doesn't keep failing. <coughs> Errors might cause an open stream from move, to move from close to open. So that what happens is sometimes you call a server or you can do something that may or not may raise an exception or an error in a callback as uh, not the is lost. Um, so that could cause the upstream without the user not notifying the, uh, the framework to be open uh, because Visigoth has detected that this uh, node is not healthy enough. And the statistics of who such can be collected um, to just help you know in every case. That's, I have already been here. Okay, and then show me the code again. So, uh, this one is a more complex one. It's still simple enough, but um, we have here two strings which represents two um, servers on the internet. One is localhost 1233. No one is listening there, so it's going to cause a failure. And then the second one is http.google.com. So Google is there, I hope. Um, <laughs> so what I've done after that is first, I just do all the upstreams inside VCGov. So we can see exactly what is the status of the upstream before doing anything. And then I execute three calls um, with a sync on a series way. So first call is going to choose um, local cost because it's the first one in the list and there's no information available for. Um, health of the endpoint. Second one is going to choose Google, and it will successfully, yes, successfully connect to Google. Um, so it will come back as it was successful. And then what's going to happen in the third one? Come on. Google. Sorry? If we fail. No. Google again. Google, Google again, because localhost failed. So it opened the circuit for <coughs> localhost. And then the second one was Google. It was successful. And then the third one, the only um, available endpoint is Google. So it's only two. So let's close the fingers. <coughs> so let me explain this. It's a bit messy. Um, it's just logging the internals of this code. So this here, <coughs> from here to here, belongs to the first console.log where I just output the upstreams here. So this is telling me, probably not to many of you, that the first endpoint is closed and is localhost one, two, three, three. Mm -hmm. Second endpoint is closed and is google.com. <coughs> status timestamp time stamp is when was this status assigned. So in th that case is when the service starts and that's the upstream. Um, and that's pretty much it. So connecting to localhost, localhost failed. So it's here. That's fairly simple not code. We just physical to choose. <coughs> so it gives you um, the target, gives you the error callback, and then gives you the stats. 
So if there is an error, what they do is I mark this endpoint as an error already. Um, there are two ways of um, marking a server as faulty. One is the user decides that the, the, the service is broken and just say, yep, yeah, don't use that anymore until you know the circuit goes back again and passes the half closed stage. And the other one we'll see in the next example is uh, through a um, node later, which in this case we're using the default one. And then if it's successful, you just say it's successful. Okay? So connecting to local host, fail, and then connecting to Google was successful. That's the second call, and then here we can see the third call. It's Google again. And then after executing all the um, code, <coughs> the first node is open, which is localhost. So I suspected it fell, so it comes back as it wasn't working on. And then the second one is closed, which is Google, still um, usable. OK, so I have another example here, which is probably a bit um, more complete and a bit more, co more complex. So again, <coughs> um, this evolved, required the package. And then I pass a custom writer. That's a simple one. So the custom writer receives an upstream, which is what we pass here, plus a few um, metadata parameters. And then <coughs> checks if there is a real response time in the stats. Um, the stats can be recorded by the user. At the moment, Visigo doesn't record any automatic stats, but we might throw in there things like response time, uh, size of the response, I don't know, a few different things. And if there is not, um, if there is response time, it just gives you as a score 3,000, which is three seconds less um, the response time of the last call. So I say three seconds because Visigoth won't choose any node with a score um, below zero. So if you go zero or below, Visigoth will just, it won't open the circuit, but it won't give you this node as you can use it. So it's kind of a way of protecting, um, you know, for some reason one node is overloaded and then key cache on request. But we want to guarantee to the user that the response is going to be given in less than three seconds. So if for some reason one node goes over three seconds, it will wait until um, the response time goes down again uh, due to the load being processed. It's a nice way of load balancing the uh, in between the different servers. Um, so again, we go down here. We add two streams. I make that fairly simple. So no network cast, no anything. Um, just hardcore response time um, down here. So upstream, fast, fast stream, again, using a sync. So what happens here is if the upstream is the slowest upstream, the response time is 3,001. And if it's not, the response time is 100 milliseconds. It's a nice way of mocking the response time from the server. And same here, and same here. So three calls, and then we load the upstreams. So, as you expected, or at least I was expecting, the slow string is first and then decides that um, it's too slow to be called again. Then, fast stream, which has a 100 millisecond response time, and then fast stream again. And as you can see now, the status is closed in both because, as I said before, this ego didn't open the circuit for the slow streams because this slowness might be just the case of. Um, you know, the server being loaded, so at some point it will decide to retry again and um, close, not close the circuit, but put it back in the equation and be able to process the cross over there. So in that way, you know, um, if you're using some load balancer techniques that are questionable, uh, you know, sometimes you get more um, more load in one server than another. With this, uh, with this circuit breaker, you will be able to just, you know, distribute the load as required. <coughs> Uh, stats, in this case, a source object, because it's the object, but I only have here uh, the response time. Okay? So, um, what I've done in the code is I have prefix, um, I have suffix with dollar sign everything that the user should not touch. It's kind of a, of a convention. And it's free format variable, everything that the user could be modifying. So, if you see the code in here, somewhere. Uh, there is a lot of variables since that this is the code of PC, but this is the circuit breaker. Um, with dollar sign, this is where the user should not be modifying the data when it's um, accessing the server, as there is no such thing as private fields or um, hiding. Uh, 
And that's pretty much it. And the amazing part of this is that the full circuit breaker is 136 lines of code. So there's not really too much complexity. Um, you can see, for example, here, this is the wrong robin. Uh, again, this is a custom writer that if the user doesn't provide one, it's going to be chosen as, as default. So either you provide one or uh, just slow running. The timeout is going to be 30 seconds. So once the upstream goes into <coughs> the open status, it waits for 30 seconds to check or challenge the server again. It can be customized. It can be passed as, you know, um, as a parameter. Um, and that's information that is not really relevant. And that's the signature of this code. So we can add nodes, remove nodes, remove by a function. Choose one and choose all of them for the cell pattern. pattern. Um, that's pretty much it. That's the beautiful part of Node.js. Um, this code is going to be available at some point. So I'll let you know where <laughs> and when. Uh, probably my GitHub in a repository. And one of the questions that was in my mind is, you know, I have a few examples here, but those examples doesn't really represent our you know, a real usage of this pattern in a real framework or somewhere. So, what we have here is, um, who knows Seneca here? That's very little, come on. <laughs> okay, so it's a JavaScript yeah. framework. Um, it's um, in here. This JavaScript framework is written by pretty much Nerfram. I think Richard started that, which is the city of Nerfram, and now it's developed by a few developers in there. So one of the plugins of this framework, which it's amazing, it's um, <laughs> why <laughs> Seneca Balance Plug. So what this does is exactly uh, what I was showing to you, but um, in a more sophisticated way. So Seneca, <coughs> it's kind of a microservices framework, which um, it can be distributed. It should be distributed in fairness. So with this plugin, you can have different clients or different servers, and one client can be balancing between different servers. So what I've done is I have used Visigoth as the authoritative list of upstreams for Seneca Balance Client. And I have modified the code of this plugin to use Visigoth as um, the load balancer with circuit breaking capabilities. Not quite with circuit breaking capabilities, but load balancer for now. Um, so, and I have an example here, which I really hope to subscribe. Okay, so let me show you something first. So this is the server. That's what Seneca looks like. Um, Seneca is a pattern matching um, framework style, so you just provide patterns to Seneca and then it will reply to the patterns that you send. For example, if you want to execute this method here, you just do a Seneca act and then use this pattern. You can pass variables, you can pass, can you decouple the logic of different endpoints and different concerns and it's fairly easy to scale systems using this framework. So this is the server, a simple one, um, listens into a board um, and then expects this pattern and this is the client. Here's where the magic happens. So we are specifying use the balance plugin. This balance plugin is my plugin. 47,000 is the port for the first um, server, which I already spin up in the terminal. This one here. Uh, what do you say? Address and use. Yeah, it happens sometimes. Yeah. Especially if you execute twice the same command. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 47,000, 47,000. Okay, uh, and now the client, what it's going to do is it's going to send 10 requests to Seneca. It doesn't really tell to send this to one server or the other. It's busy got the one who is going to choose to which server to send the request. And in this case, it's using the wrong robin. So it's going to send five requests, I hope, to each server. Okay, so let's play with my life. I think the two terminals. Client looks like it worked. So I am just logging the coming back from the server. And now, if you look into the first endpoint, um, you can see entry, exit, entry, exit, entry, exit, entry, exit. That makes five requests. 
and the second endpoint is the same, five requests. Replying back. So this is a real use case with a real framework that is being used by three companies of this uh, one, which is a simple behavior. And I think now is the time for questions. I'm done. Yeah, um, very interesting. Thanks for sharing. Thank um, you. What is the performance versus a, a normal load balancer? HA proxy. I haven't I haven't checked performance. Um, this is more uh, about circuit breaking than balancing. Uh, I know the majority of the examples are load balancing, but <laughs> it's more about the capability of being able to remove one server from the pool if it's misbehaving. Alert someone and then you know keep trying every few seconds to see if it can solve and if it doesn't resolve, yes, come back. Um, that's a good point. We should be doing some performance testing before merging that into somewhere values. But uh, not for now. Uh, I watched uh, with Docker at CoreOS, there is something that uh, uh, automatic uh, turning off and on servers. And the, the, uh, there is uh, something like this, which uh, yeah. I, I, I'm not, I don't know how to express myself, but maybe you know what. Yeah, I think it's the same. I think it's a circuit breaker, but it's using uh, different frameworks. Uh, using different ah, frameworks. but it's concept is the same. It's a pattern itself. Like uh -huh. what they've done here is an implementation of a pattern. Uh -huh. But uh, for example, N service boost. Uh, I'm not a dominant developer, but uh, I wrote a plugin for Seneca. No, it's not this one. Um, there you go. I wrote a plugin for Seneca. For N service boost. Mm -hmm. anybody, anybody knows what N service boost is? Yeah. Well, I didn't know when mm -hmm. I started doing that, but yeah. It's kind of a, a messaging queue, it's more mm -hmm. a, an enterprise boost um, for .NET platform, but mm -hmm. it can be, um, you can talk to the N service boost mm -hmm. uh, through RabbitMQ. Mm -hmm. So this also has a circuit breaking in there, which mm -hmm. is fairly sophisticated for some reason. And I don't know exactly how they do it, but they can detect when there is the network address bound to a customer mm -hmm. and do the circuit breaker on real time, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Because one of the problems with uh, what I'm doing, which I don't think I should solve yet, but it will hit me at some point, is you are giving 30 seconds, or 10 seconds, or two seconds, for the endpoint to get back mm -hmm. into business. But what happens if the server, if the server is having intermittent failures? Mm -hmm. You could be having problems in the network, and then you're gonna just remove all the servers from your endpoint, and you're gonna have, you're gonna have problems where you might be processing a few requests, so things like that. Yeah, but it's widely used the uh, circuit breaker. Okay, okay. More questions? Come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, but your uh, circuit breaker is in the open state, like when it's activated. How does it check server after, like, is it, does it check in after, like, certain intervals? That's to be, to be, how does it return back to closed state? Yeah, I'll show you the code. So it doesn't do any magic, it doesn't do any asynchronous uh, job checking is there time yet, is there time yet, or anything like that. So that was one of the key points that I was struggling with. So when you receive the, this API tools, can you see all the code? API choose is when you call to choose. Um, for example, when you call choose, at the end of the day, it calls API choose. Okay. At the end of the day, it calls here. So the first thing it does is it goes through all the upstreams with a for each, and then checks if the status is open. Open means there's no request flowing through the, the server. And then if the, if the timestamp of the opening status is over the time, time, time that you provide for reclosing the circuit, it does <coughs> mark a scarf open. And then down the line, <coughs> somewhere, here, in these three lines, if the status, after being successful, is half open, it closes the circuit and assigns again the date, and that's it. 
So there's no asynchronous processing there. It's just the next request is going to fire off all the magic for calculating the status for every node. Again, it doesn't add any load to the system. So you can have 200,000 instances of Visigoth, and it's going to only use space in memory. It's not going to use CPU power unless you execute choose, which is fairly light. So, more questions? Okay. Uh, I think there was someone in there first. Yeah. Uh, just if you're running this in the with cloud based downstreams, would you, uh, if the circuit breaker tripped, would you be able to kill off the downstream? And just spin up in the instance of it? Um, so you, your question is more like if you are having an upstream and the upstream is gone. Yeah, yeah if, you, if what your circuit breaker yeah. is protecting, if that goes down, but it's a cloud thing, we'd be able to just kill it off and spin uh, up the You could because you can remove, um, I have provided the API to remove upstreams. So API remove and remove back. So you could potentially make your software smart enough to detect there is a problem here, remove the upstream fully. Um, if you leave it there, Visigoth is gonna only try once every time out. So it's not gonna be a major deal. Like this pattern, I like this pattern because it, it puts in the human factor. Like how many of you didn't ever have a bug in the code? Like everybody has bugs and everybody has problems. So why don't we just work out to have those problems min minimized? and not being, you know, so diligent trying to remove them. So that's the idea of having the timeout and only trying once every timeout. Because at the end of the day, if you're having one failure every 30 seconds, it's bad, but it's probably okay in the majority of the cases. So that's it. Um, the answer is, if you want to remove the, the endpoint, it has to be manual. Like, I didn't want, don't think it's even the place to add more logic to, you know, detect a client problem or a server problem. Because at the end of the day, as you can see in the examples, like non robin it doesn't even talk about servers. It's just, you know, three strings are being chose, chose um, one by one. So there's not really a huge complexity in there. I'm saying strings, you could be, I don't know, using a printer. Is a printer busy? Yes, open the circuit. It's back in business, use it. So things like that. More questions? It, it, just in terms of the, the recovery strategy, uh, you know, which which leads to a failed request potentially once every thirty seconds. Um, did you consider just using some form of a ping for for a recovery? Um, there is a health check for that. Um, you can do one thing, which um, it could be a bit awkward, but it can be done. Here, um, that was I can see. In that case, the node writer, let's go back, you know, custom writer, then we pass the function that gives you back the score. You could be cutting the health, um, the health endpoint of the upstream here. Just health check, give me back 200 milliseconds, fine. Upstream dot meta dollar sign dot status close, back in business. So you could be doing that here as well. Um, I didn't want to embed um, more logic in Visigoth because as I say, it's not oriented to servers only, but it will mainly be used for servers. But even, I'll show you the code of the um, um, Seneca load balancer, if I can. So what is happening here, in reality, you don't you don't deal with servers in this. This is the plugin that they have written for Seneca to use the PC one as a load balancer. You don't deal with um, uh, second. You don't deal with servers. You are fine. You are dealing here with a function. Sure. So what is happening is Seneca is passing back to Visible a function that is going to be its upstream. If that function is calling a server or is booking your holidays, <coughs> Visible doesn't know. So it's kind of awkward to just record. Um, it's a good idea, but um, when you are into the, you know, trying to make it work on pretty much not every case because that's impossible, but in the, the cases that you can see, like this is the first example. 
that you know when I was doing it, I was like, oh my god, why do we want to handle strings in, in a SQL breaker? There you go, it's a function, so <laughs> it's not really a server. Yeah, no, I, I get that, but I'm, I'm kind of thinking, you know, just supply an additional function. Here's my help check function. Yeah, you could do that. Yes. Uh, as well, another thing that I'm thinking in modifying, but again, it's down the line. I want it to work first, um, keep things simple. Um, so here, when you open this, this is busy what again? When you open, no, that's not busy. That's busy. When you open the zip with here, I want to provide a callback. What to say? <laughs> well, the good point is it didn't happen to me. <laughs> so what I was going to say, here, when you open the circuit again, I wanted to provide here a callback to notify your monitoring system or your log saying something is going on. Yeah. More questions? No more questions? So it's clapping time. <laughs>